All right. Well, I am here. My name is Bobby Angel. Uh, I'm a campus minister, a teacher, a husband, a father, and a juggler of too many things. And that's why I feel uh, called and convicted to um, ask the wonderful Dr. Gregory Bataro uh, to chat about uh, his work, his ministry, his story. Um, he just wrote a book um, that I've had the privilege to get and read through called the mindful Catholic finding God one moment at a time and wanted to give him some space to talk about his work and, and what he does. And, and, um, he was blessed to, uh, I was blessed to have him free up a little bit of his schedule to, to chat about this stuff. So Dr. Gregory, thank you for making time here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. This is a, a great opportunity. I really appreciate it. And I, I'm looking forward to just having a conversation with you. Yeah. Now, as an introvert, as I said, this is painful for me to put myself <laughs> out here without my wife, who's um, keeping our children alive. We have three. You have four children. Four, yeah. 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 God bless you. Yeah. Thanks. That's great. Um, so. Well, we'll get through yeah. this together. Well, well <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be okay. <laughs> what's what's your story? My story. Well, I, uh, I I'm a husband, a father of four. Uh, I'm a Catholic psychologist, and so um, ever since I was I was uh, discerning my vocation and path in life, at, and and just kind of figuring out what to do, I always knew that it was going to help people, and it was going to be from a Catholic perspective. And I did spend about four years discerning religious life with the CFRs, and. Um, I saw some of your recent posts. You had Father Agostino out there visiting. Yep. So I was with them. I was with the CFRs, and uh, Father Agostino knows knows my story well, and um, it was a, it was a helping hand in in the discernment process. When actually, when I was leaving, uh, feeling called to be married, and then I went to school uh, for psychology and got my doctorate uh, from a program that deeply integrates Catholic philosophy and theology. So. It's really an integration of all those different fields that led to my professional degree and now my professional work. So I'm the director of the Catholic Psych Institute, which is um, it's a group I formed uh, about five years ago. And so now we have uh, nine therapists and myself working to, you know, heal, bring healing to people, facilitating God's grace through the integration of the, the science of psychology with with the uh, philosophy and theology of our faith. I met you, so you were with the CFRs for a bit. I assume you had an amazing beard while I you were did, there. Man. It, was, it was awesome. It was like down to here. <laughs> yeah. Do you miss it? I do sometimes, yeah. I saw a picture pop up a little while ago, and uh, I was like, man, I wonder if it would ever be something that I'd do again. <laughs> it would scare off any clients or, yeah. uh, or children. You have to be mindful of that. Um I met you, you, uh, I was taking a, a love and responsibility course. Um, uh, Carol Wojtyla, who became John Paul II, wrote a book before he was Pope um, called Love and Responsibility, which is dense and philosophical, but an amazing um, philosophical treating of human love. And um, I was taking a week course on this, and you came in and, and taught for like a day and a half, this little interim uh, and you, you brought in some of this mindfulness and the psychology stuff. And first I'm like, what is this guy on? Who is this guy? Um, yeah. And by the end of it, I'm like, tell me more. Tell me more. Um, and it was just making sense. And so, you know, sometimes we, we brush off or we make fun of psychology or in the theology realm. It's like, uh, you know, some of the pop psychology, the self-help stuff. So how have you integrated the, the Catholic faith with um, – your psychology background? Well, you know, it's, it's always been sort of organically deeply integrated within me. Um, and I, I didn't always know how to necessarily articulate that and like put it into my actual practice. But, you know, for myself, I used to practice a lot of prayer that was focused on the present moment and something that I actually learned from Father Benedict Rochelle as a mm -hmm. friar. And he was just always talking about like just being at peace in the moment and, and knowing where God was and trusting him. And he kind of had like a spirituality of the little way, abandonment to divine providence. And then when I started studying psychology, 
I was practicing, you know, learning about mindfulness as a, as a psychological intervention. And then just like after a few years, it kind of clicked like, wait a minute, these are the, the same brain patterns. Like these are the same things going on in my mind at the same time, obviously from two totally different lenses, but they could easily be integrated in the way that they're taught. And so that's how I kind of fleshed it out to figure out that there's a psychological human side to our spiritual lives. And so, yes, we want to count on God's grace and abandon ourselves to him and enter into his presence. But there's also work for us to do. And so the better we understand the way our minds work and the more access we have to, you know, our freedom and making choices and how we spend our time thinking and what we're thinking about, the more we facilitate God's grace. And so that's the that's sort of like the the team effort that he's created us for. And so our our efforts combine with his in that in that sense. And so that's that's where I've I've sort of taken as my launch point from to to flesh out this integration of like how to really bring in the faith at a, at a, at a deeper level or a bigger level, uh, there's, there's definitely, um, you know, a lot of ways where our anthropology informs the psychology. So in other words, as Catholics, we know what we're created for, how we're created. And so that's the stuff that the blueprints of our humanity. So that's where you have to start if you're going to know where things go wrong. You know, so if you go to the car mechanic and the, and the guy has no idea how the car is put together and what it's supposed to do, then, you, you know, he doesn't stand a chance at actually fixing it and making it better. And so in, in general, psychology is a field run amok with a bunch of people that have no idea how the human person is actually built. But by bringing in the Catholic faith and understanding the anthropology, we have the blueprints. We know what we're created for. And we can really discern how and why things go wrong when they do. And then we have a path to know how to bring people back towards their own fullness. It, it's, um, you know, what, what sin does, it's a rupture between the head and the heart in a profound way. And so I see that um, obviously having a psychological effect and i think we look at the scriptures and jesus story and it's easy to to put our current psychology or secular mindset onto there well that would that expelling demons was just bad you know they were schizophrenic or these things that were just the the primitive way of understanding it's like no he drove out demons he drove out like the sin it's like and death and and um that rupture between the head and the heart the body and the soul that without a Christian worldview, we're just kind of knocking our head against the wall, trying to find some kind of utopian fix. And what I, what drew me to the theology of the body and love responsibility and, and deeper into the beauty of the Catholic faith was this reintegrating the, the head and the heart. And I see that with some of the work you're trying to do and the mindfulness um, kind of buzzword of today that I hear all over the place. And, um, was a little like, well, like, just what is this about? Had like a healthy skepticism. Yeah. Like, does, does this uh, gel with our Catholic faith? And in the book, you do an amazing job. Again, your book's called The the Mindful Catholic here. Um, you do an amazing job of, of kind of spelling out any, any fears or any um, concerns a person may have about approaching it and the tradition we have of just what a prayer is, is essentially mindfulness. So could you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, I think it's a great point to say, you know, with, especially like looking at the theology of the body, like, um, on going after the human experience and then trying to interface with the world with what's resonating in humanity. So it's like John Paul two, and even creating the theology of the body, you know, it's, it's a sense of where people are at. So there was, there was this sense of like the sexual revolution. And we, you know, we see that people are coming to a renewed understanding of the goodness of their sexuality. That's like, that's the zeitgeist. That's the, the common thread. That's the, where the culture is at right now. Okay. So let's go into that. Let's go. Let's not be afraid of that. 
let's go deep into it and figure out why. Why are human hearts resonating with this reality? And we are the we are the engineers, the surgeons. You know, as Catholics, we have the eyes to see. And so we can go into that human experience and we can start to figure out what makes sense, how it how might there be missteps? How do we really use this thing and draw it out to its deepest, fullest conclusion? So sexuality opened up the path to understanding our humanity, the whole theology of the body. Well, same thing happened here with mindfulness on a much, obviously a much smaller scale, but like the world is overtaken by this stuff with mindfulness. It's like, what the heck is going on here? So even if you didn't have this integration to start with, yeah. as Catholics, we're supposed to be open to the human experience. And you have to be able to just step back and say, what is happening here? Why are so many people talking about this? Does it work? If it works, why? Let's get in there with those sort of Catholic engineering you know, glasses and our little tools, and we can start to pick it apart and look at what's happening here. So that's what I did. And then, and then I discovered there's, there's a deep human truth here, and it has to do with our physiology. It has to do with our sense of being secure and safe in the world. And if we go even deeper, you realize that there is a Catholic reason for why we're safe. And that's where all this flood of integration came from. It's like, well, Jesus told us, do not be worried about the things of your life. He commanded us. He didn't say, you know, it's better to be peaceful instead of anxious. He said, do not be worried about the things of your life. And, and, he, and the reason is, look, God takes care of the flowers. He takes care of the birds. How much more does he love you? He's going to take care of you. You have nothing to worry about. So that's the foundation. Then it shouldn't be a surprise that there's a resonance in the human psyche and in the human brain, and that it's actually healthy to follow the commands of Jesus. So if we can let go of our anxiety, we can let go of our fears, it makes us healthier. And that this is what the foundation for mindfulness is, for Catholic mindfulness and and then we'll find that there are correlates in Catholic prayer, because if it's a Catholic truth, then it obviously would have been there from the beginning. So then we do see that there are things like abandonment to divine providence by Jean-Pierre de Cussade. And there is the practice of the presence of God by Brother Lawrence of the resurrection. And these are the spiritual facets, the, the spiritual sides of what's happening within the human person. Spiritually speaking, we can say these prayers, we can direct our hearts, and we can move our spirits in this direction of developing a sense of trust and developing a sense of abandonment. And, and as, in terms of a spirituality, it's always been there. It's healthy to practice. And we don't need to add much to the spiritual side of it. It's already there for us. The beauty of Catholic mindfulness is that it adds to the psychological dimension. So all of these things, and we see this also in a lot of the Carmelite prayers. So in, in a lot of uh, Therese of Lisieux, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, even Elizabeth of the Trinity, there's there are a lot of mentions of these kinds of things, but they're all spiritually based, as they should be. In, in Catholic mindfulness, we're looking specifically at human psychology, at the way the mind works. And so we're understanding, okay, when you start thinking about things you're stressed out about, it's stirring up your physiological stress response, the fight or flight response. That has an, a, a, an effect on your cognitive faculties. It starts to constrict your focus. So you can't see the big picture. You really only see the thing you're worried about. That is doing certain things in your brain. That's affecting certain parts of your body. That has a trigger response and it affects your mind even more. It's all psychological. And, and, you know, Teresa of Avila had no idea about those kinds of things. Right. And in right. fact, she even made comments in her book in, in, uh, in, in the interior castle. She makes comments about uh, if only I had some way to get over this madness of thoughts in my mind. Like if only she had some Catholic mindfulness to work with, she would have, you know, that would have been a tremendous benefit. We have people centuries ago complaining of, how busy their thoughts are, how distracted they are, 
Um, I think it was like Chesterton writing about how distracted the, the century was becoming. And this was like, it wasn't even the 20th century yet or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, bro, you have no idea what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, it's gotten exponentially worse. So, so yeah, if we look, if we bring in the piece of the, of the human experience through that psychological lens and we unite that to what we already have through that spiritual lens, we bring together just a fuller human experience and it becomes incredibly effective at helping us grow in, in intimacy with God and peace. Oh yeah. Peace. And I am, I am a worrier. My, my, you know, Jackie is, is this, is a child of God. She depends, like she just leans on the father and it's beautiful. And I am the, I am absolutely the worrier in the relationship. I'm also the, the Martha. Um, I easily fall prey to the activists that to be doing things. Um, and what I, again, I loved about in reading your book and looking at, it's not an, 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 an emptying of your mind. It's not this Buddhist, like nothingness. If God, is, it, just, it was so simple when you spelled it out, that like God is in, if God is the present moment, I am that I am. If God is the eternal present, uh, the Yahweh, the, um, then God is in the present moment. God is not in the past that I'm beating myself up over. He's not in the future that I'm get, that's giving me anxiety that it doesn't even exist yet. God is in the present. And to be mindful is to literally fill your mind with the present and what is going on and being attentive to your body. Because, again, we're all prey to the phones and everything that um, all the fragmentation of the yeah. age right now. And that just leads to more anxiety. It leads to depression. It leads to all the things that the secular stats will show you. And um, to be in the present moment is to be in God's presence. It's, it's that simple and that difficult to live out, to be physically aware of what my body is doing, where my brain is. I'm talking to you. I am not thinking about X number of things. I'm not staring at my phone. Act like assuming I'm paying attention to you and I'm not to be in my body, in myself, in me is that is wow. Like I need to know that. <laughs> yeah, it's so powerful and people don't get, you know, a lot of times, you know, you'll have your worries and you have your ruminations and you have the things you're trying to plan for, like all these things. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's happening in this world of the imagination between your two ears and in the, in the mind. And the practices of mindfulness are very simply tuning into the present moment through your five physical senses. So, you know, instead of worrying about what's going to happen if I'm late to this meeting, and then you start to go through the whole like sort of domino effect of thoughts that come out of that, or what's going to happen if I, you know, yell at my kids or what's going to happen if I, you know, whatever. I tell people, pay attention to the feeling of sitting in your chair. What is it? What does your butt feel like on your seat? Yeah. You know, and when people start to do that, then they say, well, aren't I just distracting myself from the issues of my life? And then, you know, the point is, well, if that's the way you want to look at it, then fine. But let's define our terms correctly. You're distracting yourself from your fantasies in your head with reality. So, yes, if you want to see that, say that that's like a kind of distraction, sure. You're distracting yourself away from your anxiety, which is really the fantasy. You're building the story in your head with reality. So I don't know if that's a bad kind of distraction necessarily. It seems like that's probably a good kind of distraction. You're being distracted by life. You're actually living alive. You're waking up to reality. And we have a sense of this, like wake up and, and, and smell the roses, that's not the phrase. What's the phrase? Stop and smell the roses. <laughs> do as the Romans do. Yeah, we're <laughs> one of those. Yeah. But you know, if we have we have this idea of like we'll burn plugging that into the senses. <laughs> what was that? We'll burn that bridge as we cross it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's you know that's we we know that's a good thing, and we just have to sort of go all in with it and realize that yeah, actually that's better than you feeling like you have control by planning everything out in your head. That's actually just an illusion. Right, well, and the, it's that balance of you need to do certain prep and prepare for meetings and, and plan ahead for scheduling and, and whatever, but there's that line of worry and anxiety when we're called to live in peace and 
entrust ourselves to a father that loves us. And I think most of us don't really believe that, or we have a kind of intellectual, yeah, yeah, God's the father loves me, but we don't live like it. We haven't experienced it. We haven't maybe had to abandon ourselves to that trust. We don't trust God to right. take care of us. That's right. Yeah. And Catholic mindfulness is, is a way to manifest our faith. So it's a way to connect the dots between our faith, you know, that we proclaim to believe when we're praying or at church or, or whatever, having spiritual conversation, and then our emotional lives that we're actually living every day. So the way we feel, the way that we're processing our thoughts and feelings when we're stuck in traffic, when we have to plan something, when we have to do something, that's that's our real life. That's actually who we are. Yeah. And so the way to connect the dots between these two things is that you let your emotional life become a manifestation of the trust that you actually do have in God. And then through these concepts of Catholic mindfulness, you really can figure out where you're not connecting the dots and where you're not actually manifesting a belief and trust in God. And it'll help us grow light years in terms of really putting ourselves in his embrace and, and really growing close to him. At the end of each chapter of your book, you have different exercises um, that you do to put this into practice. And the first, I read it through and I, I did the first one or two and then I'm like, I'm just going to finish the book and I don't have time for the, like it was, I was laughing myself. I don't have time to do this mindfulness exercise. I just want the information. Yeah. I'm like, wait, I think I'm missing the point. Yeah. <laughs> And since have gone back and and done some, and I, it's like, it, it's really like I had the thought of again of, of Brother Lawrence and, and Jean Pierre. Um, it's about becoming a mystic, it, and not again. I'm going to levitate. I'm going to bilocate. It's it's about, and again, entrusting myself to the present moment where God is, and yeah. uh, that embracing that being overdoing mentality that to be Marian. Um, sitting at the foot of Christ before I, I be, do the Petrine, before I'm Peter and I go out and, and do things I need to sit and be and receive. Um, things things I need to remind myself of every day. Are there any kind of exercises you could just kind of throw out there? Like what is what does a mindfulness exercise look like? Like an example of that. Well, yeah, there's, I mean, there's all different kinds of exercises that, that are, uh, that accentuate and exemplify certain aspects of the course and of the book. So like as you're teaching, as I'm teaching different, uh, different concepts, there's a different, there's different exercises that correspond. But one that comes to mind based on what you were just saying is, is the sort of the culmination of Catholic mindfulness, which is ultimately we see, it teaches us to see with the eyes of God, to see as God sees to, to the extent that's possible. And that means that, so if, if mindfulness defined simply is non-judgmental awareness of the present moment, and the deepest core of awareness that we have in every present moment is our very selves. So, through this process of learning how to have this non-judgmental awareness, we end up having non-judgmental awareness of ourselves. And in doing that, we uncover all of the th thoughts and narratives of deep, deep, deep judgment that we have against ourselves. And we, and we dissipate and those things dissipate even more because as we're really aware of ourself and really present with ourself, the core reality of our very being is that we are made in the image of God who is infinite truth, goodness, and beauty. So if that's really sitting at the core of our being and that's really a thing, like we really believe that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, we're made in the image of infinite goodness, infinite love, infinite beauty. Then by moving through the narratives of our own filters and the way we see things and actually just settling in on the awareness of the presence of our very own self, it's almost like settling in at the bottom of the ocean after everything is stirred up and then everything quiets and stills down. We are in the presence of, of the divine image. Now, if we, if we want to talk about mysticism, this is it. Yeah, yeah. Just sitting in the presence of our own 
being, being created in the image of God. Now, that's not to say that we're sitting in the image of in, in the presence of God himself just because we're with ourself. That's a step too far. But we're in the presence of the image of God himself. So, I mean, if we could go to a museum and be caught up in ecstasy and enamored with a beautiful painting or a sculpture. Right. How, how much more so than a, 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 a walking, breathing, living, loving image of God himself? And then that will allow us to understand the creator and be in the creator's presence even more. But all, all throughout this is this atmosphere of mercy. Because having a sense of ourself in that way means that's how God sees us, or at least we're moving closer to seeing ourselves the way God sees us. God sees us as we really are. And so we're putting on the eyes of God, seeing with the eyes of God. And that means that we are learning to truly, deeply, really love with deep, deep, deep mercy. So the exercise I was thinking of is, a, is, a, is an exercise in love and mercy. And what we do is cultivate a sense of loving kindness towards people. And in, in this, so, so you just, it's a very simple exercise where you just call to mind a certain person. And you can start with somebody that's easy. Start with your wife, start with your, you know, a friend and you say, may she be well, may she be at peace, may she be without suffering, you know, and, and you just cultivate this sense and it's kind of a prayer, but it's also just a disposition. And then let's you start, move on. Let's start with my, my beautiful, amazing wife who cannot be here. What's that? I think we glitched a little bit. I said, yes, let's talk about my amazing, beautiful wife who's not here. Yeah, exactly. So you could, yeah, we glitched there for a minute, but you could, you can. Yeah, I got sensing that peace. You can set, you can cultivate a sense of peace and of loving kindness towards another person. And then you can, as a start, using that as a starting point, you can cultivate that same loving kindness towards yourself. And a lot of people, when I say, to say, may I be without suffering? They're like, whoa, wait a minute. Aren't we supposed to be okay with suffering? And why you're trying to make the cross go away and like all this stuff. It's like, no, but could you, could you say, would you say a prayer for your wife? May she be without suffering? Like, yeah, of course you would. Well then why, right. why can't you have that same disposition of loving kindness towards yourself? And then also, it may or may not be harder for everybody. It's different, but cultivate that towards somebody that you don't have a good relationship with. So somebody that's even an enemy. When God mm -hmm. says love, when Christ says, love your enemies, we can cultivate that same sense of loving kindness. May he be without suffering. May he be well, may he be at peace. And we're, what we're doing is seeking to change the disposition of our hearts so that we're actually stepping out into the world of the way God sees things. So that's a really cool exercise that we can practice every day that uh, sort of helps us tap into that piece of the presence of God in the present moment. We usually are beat ourselves up most of all. Yeah. I can be kind and, and sense peace and want these great things for other people, but I don't deserve it. I, I need to suffer. I need to offer it up or right or even just what you're saying and resting in this, the amount of baggage and wounds and just stuff we tend to carry around when God's like, I want you to be free. I want you to, to live. Um, it just, I sense like great healing that can come about through some of these exercises. There's so much, there's so much healing that this, this cuts through. It's like years and years of therapy's worth of just cutting through the garbage and you know, it's interesting. There's a lot of overlap, actually, with uh, chapter four of Amoris Laetitia from Pope Francis, where he talks about loving according to 1 Corinthians 13. And in the section that says in, in, of, of forgiveness, he talks about forgiving your spouse. And he mentions how you cannot forgive your spouse if you can't forgive yourself. Because mm -hmm. this, a disposition of forgiveness has to be the fruit of, of understanding what it's like to be sinful and in error and yet still loved. 
And if we can understand what that's like for ourselves, I know my weakness, I know my sin, I know my imperfection, and yet here I sit, still loved. Yep, yep. Then we can then then what other choice do we have but to give that to other people? So we see our spouse in full, you know, full HD, where it's like, yep, you you have some imperfections. Ultra 4K. Yeah, Ultra 4. Yeah, we're past HD now. We're in Ultra 4K. <laughs> and, and we're definitely seeing that, you know, those imper- – and yet we can say, well, despite seeing all those things, I still love you and I still accept you and welcome you in and we can still reconcile and we can still forgive you. And and it's because I know I know what that is like. I know what that dynamic is like because I can receive it myself first. So, so there are deep that this is all about seeing the way God sees and, and being able to be into in you know plugged into His presence in the present moment, that that transforms our way of seeing this way and it has wide-reaching effects both in healing ourselves and then also healing our relationships. That's amazing. Um, so, where can people reach you, or if they want to know more about you or your work, what are the best avenues? Yeah, a couple of things. So the the book is the Mindful Catholic. That's on Amazon, so you can you can order that. And then um, I have a course. The course that I teach on Catholic mindfulness as well is uh, is at catholicmindfulness.com. And then um, my practice, we have a, you know a number of therapists that are all doing this work of integration, helping people feel and experience the healing of God in their lives, is catholicpsych.com. Catholic P S Y C H. Dot com. And so you can learn more about our practice there. And there's a, a link to contact us uh, for, with, with inquiries. Awesome. Any other thoughts or anything you'd like to just kind of leave with? Uh, you know, I just, just really, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to speak with you and, and um, you know, just really pray, you know, for, for your audience and, and the work you guys are doing and for your ministry. And, uh, you know, just, just uh, keep it, keep me in your prayers and, you know, let's all get each other one step closer to God. Yeah, amen, amen. Again, on this, so I apologize for any technical issues. You may beginner, big time and a half. But Dr. Gregory, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, have this little conversation, and we'll absolutely keep you in prayer. And um, yeah, let's let's try to get to heaven together. Awesome. Thank you. God bless you. God bless, man.